Consider the thought that what we call civilization did not rise in Mesopotamia, Sumner, or Egypt, or for that matter, anywhere in the Middle East. What if what we call the beginning is really the re-beginning, a rebirth of a culture that spans back to a time that we have lost sight of? Hi, I'm Dr. Rita Louise, and this is Just Energy. Just Energy is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. All around the world, we find enigmatic structures and archaeological wonders that stand in the way of a uniform understanding of who we are as a people. Sifting through the historical and archaeological evidence, today's guest, Jim Willis, will probe the myths, stories, histories, and facts of ancient civilizations, lost technologies, and bygone religions to tease out the truth of our distant past and modern existence. He will take an in-depth look at the facts, fiction, and controversies of our ancestors' origins and who we are as a people and who might have come before us. Jim Willis is the author of nine books on religion and spirituality. He has been an ordained minister for over 40 years while working part-time as a woodworker and handyman. The host of his own drive time radio show, he acts as the Arts Council Director and adjunct college professor in the fields of world religion and instrumental music. His book is Ancient Gods, Lost Histories, Hidden Truth, and the Conspiracy of Silence. His webpage is jimwillis.net. So please welcome Jim Willis. Hey Jim, how's it going? Going well, going well. Well, I'm really excited to have you on the show and to find you, you know, and your work. <laughs> I think we have probably have a lot of things in common. I'm sure we do. I've looked at your website and uh, we have to meet in person sometime. Well, that sounds very cool. Um, but let's start here. Your first time guest. What got you started, you know, digging into ancient mysteries and spiritual traditions and just down that whole road? I, that's a hard question to ask. I have to go <laughs> way, way back for that. When I was, I, I, I think I must have ancient peoples in my DNA because when I, well, obviously all of us do, but when I was, uh, when I was just a kid and reading about history, I used to be fascinated about the old stuff, for instance, in American history. And then as soon as the Europeans moved in, I started to lose interest. I was more interested in the old timers. The trouble is that um, what we were tested on in school, I've discovered, many of the things that we were tested on and told we had to go along with, you know, the the, uh, the professors or the teachers would, would kind of look down their noses on us unless we could feed back all the information we were given. But then much of that, of course, I'm 70 years old, so it was a long time ago that this happened, but even so, most of that has just plain been proven wrong. And the more I looked into it, the more I began to get really upset that our culture and our education, our uh, academia itself, teaches us um, basically uh, it's an illusion. It's, it's just simply not the case. I distinctly remember being in fifth grade and hearing a teacher tell me that, he, that we might be reading sometime that the Vikings got over here to America but don't believe it he said it started with columbus well now it turns out the vikings are really um, latecomers so to speak and so as i began to look at all of this i began to wonder why aren't we taught this and then i started teaching myself and i began to get a little idea of how academia works when you've got a textbook or when you, even worse when you've written the textbook and um you got your tests all made up years you know, that we might want to use in the past and and you've got all your information and all your lectures set it's very difficult to all of a sudden start changing things it's much easier to sweep things under the rug to just say by the party line and that's it and uh, then 
all the facts go out the window and we're left with what I call the conspiracy of silence. Uh, not that there's a, a group out there that's trying to keep us from knowing these things. It's just that it's so much easier just to go along with what's been taught for so many years. And that's what people have been doing. So I became a little bit ang angry about this and I began to research it and look into it. And when I got together with uh, Roger Janicki over at um, Visible Ink Press, we were talking about this and he said, we need a book on the subject. So I wrote Ancient Gods and before Ancient Gods even come out, as a matter of fact, it's not even going to be out, I guess, until February 14th. So we have another couple of weeks before it's out. But the pre-sales were so strong, he said, we need a sequel. So last week, I sent him the, the sequel called Supernatural Gods, which is kind of a, a, um, the next step, so to speak. That's where, I, that's where it all came from. That's how I got interested, and that's where Ancient Gods uh, originated. Okay, so I don't mean to go off on a tangent here already. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but it happens. Sure. You know, but you talked about the teachers and their tests, and I can, I can wrap my mind around that. You know, but then we have researchers who are putting out cutting-edge information, and they are dismissed um, yeah. and pushed, you know, kicked out of academia, and, you know, you know they're – They'll have fines where they'll say, oh, well, this was from 50,000 years ago or 800,000 exactly. years ago. And, exactly. and academia goes, well, no, it couldn't have happened that way, so you're crazy. So it's wanna... not even just education that they're teaching uh, bad information. It's like scientists and researchers aren't really open to hearing something that doesn't fit inside the box. Exactly. I had a tragic story about that. A, uh, a man who I've had quite a bit of contact with who's worked on the Topper site about 40 miles south of us on the, the uh, Savannah River has just retired from academia. But uh, his work at the Topper site took him down below the what they call the Clovis layer. Now, it is bona fide gospel in the archaeology department. It has been until recently that when uh, you get to Clovis, you're getting to the very first people. America was settled by people who came over the Siberian land bridge, uh, some people say 12, maybe up to 18,000 years ago, and that's been it. This professor got, uh, and his work on the Topper site is wonderful. He's finding artifacts that go back 40,000 years, 50,000 years, and some of these human artifacts have been dated. The soil that they're in has been dated by independent laboratories around the country and uh, coming up with the same dates. And yet this man has had to go through such persecution. He has actually told his students in archaeology, if you discover something older than Clovis, bury it, cover it up, or you're going to kill your career. Can you imagine anything as terrible as that? But I'm, I'm encouraged by this, though. Thank goodness for television, the History Channel and those things, because now some of these young uh, archaeologists who are kicked out of the latest symposium can do an end run around archaeology by going right to the people and, and putting out some of these programs. Now, a lot of times it doesn't have the peer review and the research that they would like to have, but at least the people are hearing about it and asking mm -hmm. questions. So maybe it's getting a little harder. I hope. I hope. Exactly. Well, you know, I would love to interview this guy about the Topper site, you know, because I, yeah. you know, there has been, I've had conversations with people that perhaps the giants were the native race in the yes. Americas, yeah. uh -huh. you know, and I think that would be interesting to see what he has uncovered. Uh, he's, he's, he's retired now, but I will pass on your invite and I'll see if I can get him in touch with you. Okay. That would be great. Real good. Real good. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Okay. 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 So there there are many that contend that uh, civilization, the first advanced culture on Earth, first appeared about 6,000 years ago. But mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like you agree with that ideology. And if not, is there evidence that, yes. <laughs> that we can access of, <laughs> of an advanced culture? Yes, I think so. The traditional party line is that uh, civilization began with the agricultural revolution six to 8,000 years ago. Sumeria, Mesopotamia, uh, perhaps all were also in, uh, in Egypt at the same time. And the idea was that with the agricultural revolution, people could now stay in one place. They had a bona fide food supply, uh, guaranteed food supply. They could start to build cities and they could do all of that. And uh, then civilization began and that was the beginning. Then came 
Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. <laughs> Gobekli Tepe uh, all of a sudden shows up unquestionably some six to eight thousand years before the pyramids, um, before the agricultural revolution. Now this turns archaeology up on its up on its head. What do we do? And when you accept Gobekli Tepe as being way before the archae the, the the agricultural revolution, then all of a sudden these other anomalies all around the the world um, from uh, in India, um, places in in uh, eastern I mean in in the western part of the United States uh, and in Central America and in South America unquestionably predating the agricultural revolution and unquestionably needing a settled population and a big settled population to do what they did using technologies that we just simply don't understand how did they move those massive boulders how did they get them there how could, we can't even do that with some machines we've got and they come up with all these wonderful theories about how these things were built truth is we just don't know so i think I those can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I the my I, I got a real a kick out of talking to the people. For instance, when I was over in uh, in looking at pyramids in Egypt, and um, I understand that you've had uh, Andrew Collins mm -hmm. on your show. Uh, Andrew Collins and I have written back and forth uh, five or six, seven times. He's I, I call him a mentor whom I have never met. Someday I hope to meet him. But when I look at his work, for instance, on Gobekli Tepe and uh, and uh, some of the ideas about how they got these big boulders there and how they moved these things and how a Stone Age culture had the, the smarts to do it, I just don't think it's possible. I just don't think it's possible. We can come up with ideas when I was over in, I was going to tell you when I was over in Egypt, um, the big thing was that they, well, it was simple. They all, they always, they always started by saying it was simple. Uh, they built this ramp that goes around and then they just moved this up a ramp. And I said, well, what's the proof of the ramp? Well, the proof is that we got a group of uh, students over here and there are about a hundred of them. And we moved this ramp, this, this big boulder, we moved it about 50 feet, 60 feet. And that proves that it can be done. Well, it moves you can it proves you can move a boulder 50 or 60 feet in order to build the pyramids you had to get a ramp how are you going to move this thing up, up basically a, a five six seven story building height and then when you get up there they can say you've got all these people but you've still got to wiggle this rock multi-ton boulder and rock into place with tolerances so tight you can't even get a piece of paper between them there's not enough people to gather around that rock and move it and shimmy it back and forth to get it into place and then you've got to have the evidence of the ramp itself there's no evidence anywhere in egypt of this ramp which in order to do what it's supposed to do uh would have been more massive than the pyramid itself and there's no uh, place there's no dump you know where you go and take off this this material after you built it and put it away no, no nothing like that how did they do it well they had to have a technology and so I think our whole idea of this gradual uniform evolution from six to eight thousand years ago of civilization from there to here I, I think it just has to fly out the window there's too many anomalies there's too many questions and unless we admit that it it has to be this way that there have to have been previous civilizations that had this kind of technology till we admit that we're not going to study the problem so the first thing is admitting that we don't know then we can say now let's try to find out why that's that's where i'm at right now <laughs> anyway. yeah me too um you know you were talking about agriculture but why mm -hmm. agriculture i mean agriculture is labor intensive Mm -hmm. you no, know, it is finicky. Yes. You no, know? I mean then you get into the whole domestication of crops, which yeah. you know is one of my favorite topics to talk about. <laughs> domestication of animals. How the heck did we do that? Let's, yes. We, let's not go there. But why agriculture? Why develop? I'm going to say a technology that's harder than what you were doing mm -hmm. before. Exactly. Uh, I have a, a kind of a pet theory about that, and that's that along with agriculture came um, writing as we know it. Uh, I think writing is much older, but anyway, our what you know, 
our, our general idea is that with agriculture came the invention of, of writing. And now we say that that's where history begins with the advent of writing, because that's now we can begin to see exactly what people were saying. Well, there were some pretty sophisticated things way before the advent of writing that are all around the world and these anomalies. So I think what we call the beginning of our civilization is simply a re-beginning. And that's where the word ancient gods came from. My, my um, premise of the book is that these people from a civilization a past civilization that was destroyed, some kind of national, natural calamity perhaps, or perhaps even uh, more disturbing, human hubris and uh, our lust for power and all of that can destroy civilizations as we're beginning to find out. Um, when that happened, there were survivors of this advanced civilization and the world underwent a great change and those survivors showed up at the Stone Age cultures of the people who survived the worldwide calamities. And those people had such great technology and such a, 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 um, a, a spiritual approach, we'll call it, that they were eventually, over the course of a couple of generations, looked back to not as just really wise people, but as gods. Uh, they were they they knew so much more they must have been somehow um godlike divinity and so they began to get those uh titles and we know some of their names uh, quetzalcoatl for instance and uh um, um old from the middle east um gilgamesh and some of those others i think these are the the ancient peoples who are re were referred to by the people who came after as ancient gods do you ascribe to these people coming from an, an you know, and I'm going to use this word, but kind of in like a very big category, mm -hmm. you know, an Atlantis, Atlantis type population where there is an advanced culture and then because of this destruction, destructive event, they mm -hmm. spread out? Yeah, I mean, because exactly. one of the things that I believe is that the mythic record that we have is based on a singular source. Yes. You know, and yes. so what spread around the world, you know, it either was aliens mm -hmm. or it came from a, I, I, an isolated population that or around the world. Or both. Um, it's hard to say. The, the Atlantis tradition is uh, generally... Well, in academia, you don't want to talk too much about Atlantis, <laughs> but the Atlantis tradition is only one of many traditions. The Hopis have a wonderfully rich mythology um, that uh, are kind of a parallel to the Atlantis myth. And in the Bible, of all things, the, the uh, pre-Diluvian cultures, um, in, in, in the Bible, we have a talk about a, um, a, a, a huge catastrophe that overtook the whole earth. And the Mayans had such a, 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 a story, and the Chinese, and people from India, and all of these cultures, they're telling the same story, that there was a great civilization that was destroyed by a great cataclysm, and then, once again, uh, a, a rebirth. And we're in a rebirth. I think there we might have had many beforehands before these two. Um, my wife and I, a number of years ago, wrote a book called uh, Armageddon Now, The End of the World, A to Z. We call it 500 pages of light reading on all the different ways the world might end. Um, but basically the idea was that when we began to study all of these cultural myths, we found so many similarities that uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that they were based on a kernel of, of, of truth, a historical kernel of truth. And then what happens, like any other story, it is laid on by layers of stories and layers of it, and, they, and they get more fantastic with the telling. But that just happens uh, in our own country. We talk about uh, Washington throwing a dollar across the Delaware, a silver dollar across the Delaware. Now, Maybe he did because um, money went a lot farther back in those days. But at, at any rate, you know, you, you get the idea that that uh, even a person like George Washington, relatively recent in history, has such a mythology built up around him over just a couple of hundred years. 
Can you imagine the mythologies that have built up over thousands of years? But at the core of them all is that one kernel of truth that says this is something that happened. People were here, they saw it, and they've passed it on through generations. Well, and the part that I find interesting with that notion is that you can take that kernel and start mm -hmm. looking at them and going, well, even within that nutshell, Mm -hmm. what is the common theme that keeps coming exactly. up and kind of like micromanage it. And the part I find interesting is looking at what happened before, you know, like mm -hmm. what led up to this and then what happened after. Because people will yeah. look at like the Noah story and be like, mm -hmm. okay, here's the Noah story, but why did that happen? You know, yeah. and start looking at these myths from other cultures because they also line up as well. Mm -hmm. And and the, the, the scary part about this whole thing is that generally speaking, these are given an ethical or a moral or a religious um, overtone. In other words, the people were guilty. When, when, let, let's put it this way. You have a catastrophe. The survivors are going to say, what happened to us? What led to this? And because we're human, we all say the same thing. What did we do to bring it on ourselves? And then we begin to make a, a moral implication about this. We tell our generations, watch out, don't do what we did. Well, when you look at the past, say the, say the, the story in Genesis of, of the, the Noah story. It was human hubris, grab for power, uh, people wanting to be uh, like God. And they brought upon themselves this great catastrophe. Frankly, I get a little worried about this when I look at the world today because we're facing some of those same things we say. We have the technology now to destroy life on planet Earth. We have the, the technology to destroy ourselves. And why would we do it? Because of the same old human hubris, the grab for power, the wanting more, more all the time. Because we're uh, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think it's only, it's only ego that says we can't do it because I think the implications of these things, and this is why I think the subject is so important, the implication is that it's happened before. It can happen again. Well, I mean, one of the things that I've put out, but, you know, I put out these statements and then people read them and they're like, sure, <laughs> you know, but that's because they don't fit into the box. Yeah. You know, I mean, and so one of the statements that I've put out was that the story of the apocalypse told in the book of Revelation is mm -hmm. not what is going to happen, but is a story of what happened in the past. And mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, get on the straight and narrow, it's going to happen again. Yes. It's that's... like, okay, the cards and letters did come. Yes. <laughs> well, I had a I had a good friend who was kind of earthy, but always used to say, you know, it's the woodchuck that sticks his head up. Is the he's the one that gets shot at. So when you stick your head up, yeah, you're going to get shot at. <laughs> There's no question about it. But I come up with good stuff. I think. Yeah. 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 And and it, it, again, uh, if if people were really interested, they would want to study these things and and find out. Instead, it's just too easy to say, oh. The conspiracy of silence. Shut it. Shunt it off to the wastebasket. Don't pay any attention to it. I think we need to pay attention. We need or, to pay. Attention. Or there's someone that will get the spotlight, mm -hmm. and then they everyone will jump on that bandwagon, and then you just yeah. get the ongoing road of some other theory, and yeah. nobody really stepping forward. And I mean, I know that in your book. Um, I'm going to pull a book out so I can have the title, Ancient Gods. Mm. You know, you talk about uh, Zachariah Sitchin. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people that have jumped on the Sitchin boat. Um, yeah. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm not going to make a judgment call about his work, but they've no. jumped on it without really investigating anything else to see if what he's saying exactly. is correct. He's, he's one of many that has hair, that had to bear the slings and arrows of a culture that just seems to want to jump on anybody who comes up and, and talks, as you say, out of the box. Um, Hugh Everett was a, a brilliant a man who was very uh, influential in um, uh, coming up with a, a good layman's definition for the multiverse, many universes, parallel dimensions and parallel universes. Um, here was a man who was a brilliant man and who did wonderful work. I mean, he worked at the Pentagon even. He was a great theoretical physicist. 
And yet he was so persecuted for his idea of saying that there might be multi-dimensions out there. There might be dimensions all around us of, of which we're not aware. And uh, those dimensions could be just, you know, are, are just as real as our universe, other universes uh, existing in other dimensions that may be only a millimeter away from us. And infinite number of universes and all of these universes could have developed be, um, uh, in intelligent beings just like us. And, uh, of course, he was absolutely ridiculed. Sad to say, the man wound up committing suicide. Mm. And now his ideas are totally accepted by even mainstream scientists. But I wanted to say, where were these people back when Hugh Everett had to go through all that they did? He never had a chance to see his ideas uh, validated as they are today. It's a tragedy. And mm -hmm. this happens in so many fields so many fields it's 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 just a real sad tragedy it is you know you know and i'm going to be coming back in my next question uh to go back to tepe as the kind of anchor point mm -hmm. um you know but i put out a piece about the burying of go back tepe you know and mm -hmm. why they chose to bury go back tepe which was yes. another one of my you know let's step out of the box yes and uh you know and my rationale was that the people saw the enclosure is being taboo that there was some kingly godly potentially sacred thing happening at that location and the laws of taboo said you can't touch it because it's sacred mm. and so to save themselves from becoming taboo and incurring the wrath of the gods they buried it it that's a that's a you know i haven't heard that well, I, that's yes, what, i made it up Oh, I think it's a wonderful idea. <laughs> I like it Why not? And they were burying it for posterity, which makes yeah. no sense to me. <laughs> I think it's a it's a wonderful idea. We ought we ought to consider these ideas. Um, why do you go to the trouble to do what they did at Gobekli Tepe, and then one generation later bury it, um, unless something was happening? Something that and was I think, so important, which was how yes. I kind of got onto this taboo thing because if mm -hmm. taboo ruled their lives, yeah, it would yeah. be important. Fascinating, fascinating. I'm going to be th I'm going to be thinking about this. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> but here's my question. You know, because what I find interesting is that we have sites like Gobekli Tepe that are estimated as being at least twelve thousand years mm -hmm. old. You know, and I think there are other sites around the world that mm -hmm. are more than 12,000 years old. Yeah. But when you look at the archaeological record, you know, there does not appear to be a culture technologically advanced to support its construction. You know, all we find are, you know, stone implements. I mean, we bows and arrow, you know, bows and arrow type culture mm -hmm. and we don't see a building culture. So what do you think is going on? I think when we talk about technology, we're, we automatically start thinking about nuts and bolts and hammers and saws and computers and that kind of thing. There's different kinds of technology, and I think this is what we really have to look at. My own particular idea is that the human human race, I like to look at the human race as... as um, as if it was a single figure and as if it was growing we go through growing stages just like humans go human individual humans go through growing stages and i think at the beginning uh of our what we call civilization i think people had what i like to call intuitive ability uh, they had let's call it a psychic sense uh, let's call it um uh, right brain thinking, uh, the ability to be able to communicate, the ability to do things that we'd call, for instance, uh, psychokinesis or something like that. They had this ability and they, they didn't understand it, they just used it. You can still find it today in the Aborigines of Australia mm -hmm. who can go long distance, you know, speak, uh, communicate with each other over long distances. It was an intuitive ability. Then came the agricultural revolution and then came our move to our left brain scientific thinking and we developed into stage two which i like to call conscious disability we became so left brain in our thinking that we lost um, the ability to do a lot of these intuitive things that our ancestors just took for granted but we're I, also I, not taught it 
I no, mean, I don't not think at all. We have lost it. I think we're just so as a matter of fact, unaware of it. Yeah, I, I think it's still there. It's just atrophied in us. We we do more than not teach it. We kind of poo poo it. You know, we just go, oh, women's intuition, that kind of thing. Everybody laughs. You know, but I think there's evidence now that we're coming out of that conscious disability stage into the third stage of development that I like to call conscious ability. It's a return to that intuitive ability that we had, but it's uh, done consciously. We're beginning to understand even the physics of it. Now, when you talk about intuitive ability, you, you can't beat the rishis of India, the wise men of India. They were just, they had such a wonderfully intuitive sense. And yet much of what they taught about the world and how the world works is also now um, coming in line with our quantum physics, uh, our understanding. Don't you and love it? They were saying the same thing, except they intuited it 6,000 years ago, and now we're finally coming around consciously to understand it. Or that information was passed down from an advanced culture that knew it. I think so. I think so. Originally, yeah. And they put the people in touch with something that they didn't understand, and they didn't have to because it works. Uh, down th even on, in our ages, there's there are many people uh, like yourself and, and, and many other people that have kept that whole idea of uh, intuition and in, intuitive ability alive who and proven that it's, it's not disappeared from the human race. It's just been pushed off into the closet and now maybe it's coming out of the closet and beginning to be found again. I'm, I'm very encouraged by it. I hope it happens in time, but I'm very encouraged by it. That's Jim Willis. His book is Ancient Gods, Lost Histories, Hidden Truths, and the Conspiracy of Silence. His webpage is jimwillis.net. And thank you for watching this portion of our interview with Jim. If you're enjoying today's programming, please click on the button below and subscribe to our channel. If you want to hear this interview in its entirety, become a Just Energy Insider at justenergyradio.com and access full shows commercial free and gain access to our over 10 years of show archives. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So until next time, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy. <laughs>